All right, so good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you in Ireland today. I'm going to start on a very, very somber note, which you're used to in the insurance industry. But I hope it'll be a liberating reflection as well. It's pretty clear that GDP is slowing all over the world. We know this. It's in every region. The reason this is happening, productivity has been declining all over the world for 20 years. No mystery. And the result is we've got very high structural unemployment, especially among the young millennial generation. They just really having a difficult time finding their place in a 21st century workforce. Our economists are projecting 20 more years of low productivity. Now let's do the numbers. We've had two industrial revolutions in the 19th and 20th century, and here's where we stand this afternoon. Arguably, Half the human race today, all of us, are far better off than our ancestors were before we began this experiment in history, correct? I think it's also fair to say that 40% of the human race making $2 a day or less, they're maybe just marginally better off. And for the 1 billion people making a dollar a day or less, we can make the case that they're worse off than their ancestors were. So while half the human race has done much better, the other half of the human race only marginally improved, the very rich have really, really done well. This afternoon, the seventh richest people in the world, we could put them in this little row, the seven richest people in the wor world today, their combined wealth equals the accumulated wealth of one half the human beings living on Earth. That's three and a half billion people. There's actually nothing like this inequality in all of human history. There's something dysfunctional here about the way the human family is organizing itself here on the planet. It's clear that we are beginning to see a slide, if you will, a decline in the industrial era, the business model, the industries, the codes and standards that governed our life over the last 50 years. But now we have a more serious crisis. After two industrial revolutions, where we literally dug up the burial grounds of a previous geological era in history, the Carboniferous era, and we animated those dead remains, coal, oil, and gas. We created a whole civilization out of that past period in history. And now we've spewed so much CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide into the atmosphere of this blue planet that we can't get enough of the sun's heat back off the planet. We are in real-time climate change. This is no longer a model or a theory or looming on the horizon. When I first started working on this issue in the 1970s, we had models, we had projections, we weren't sure. We're sure now. Climate change is here in Ireland, in Europe, in every continent in the world in real time. Here's what's frightening about climate change. And there's no industry that needs to understand this more than the reinsurance and insurance industry because you're going to be right at the center of the disruption. Absolutely because it's all about risk and unpredictability. What I'm about to tell you, I'd like to pay you to pass it on to your kids. Because if everybody understood what I'm about to say in the next two minutes, the whole human race would be terrified on mission to accomplish only one goal over the next three generations, save the species, save the earth, save our fellow creatures. Here's what climate change does. It changes the water cycles of the earth. We have the atmosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere, and the most important, the hydrosphere. We're the watery planet. It's all about water. Our ecosystems have developed over millions of years based on the cloud covers that cycle those ecosystems and the precipitation. Here's the rub. For every one degree that the temperature is going up on this planet from the uh, emission of global warming gases, for every degree it goes up, the atmosphere is actually sucking up 7% more for precipitation from the ground because the heat is forcing that precipitation quicker into the clouds. So we're getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds and wild, extreme, uncontrollable water events. Blockbuster winter snows, anybody from Boston? Seven, eight feet, the new normal. We're getting flooding across every continent in the world for months each year 
I don't have to tell you in the insurance industry, destroying infrastructure, destroying ecosystems, taking lives. We have droughts and wildfires stretching across the entire world from British Columbia to Southern California. It's all on fire for five months a year now, on fire. People are losing their lives. Infrastructure is going. We have category three, four, and five hurricanes. We've had so many hurricanes hit Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina. They cannot recuperate from the last hurricanes and there's no flood insurance. This is the new normal. This is not an anomaly. Our ecosystems cannot catch up to an exponential runaway curve in the hydrological cycle around the Earth. They can't adapt to it in this short a period of time. They're collapsing. And our scientists now tell us we are in the sixth extinction event of life on planet Earth. And it doesn't even make the headlines. No one even knows about it, actually. And it's the most dramatic moment in human history in our 200,000 years here. We're asleep. We've had five mass extinctions on this Earth in the last 450 million years, way before humans were here, because we're the babies. We're the youngest species, 200,000 years, anatomically modern humans. And each time there was an extinction event, there was a tipping plant point in the spheres, the chemistry of the spheres, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, the biosphere, the orbit of the Earth, and boom, really quick die out. And on the average 10 million years to get new life on this Earth. We're in the sixth extinction event, parents and grandparents, and the current chronicling tells us we could lose over 50% of all the species of life on Earth in the next seven or eight decades. The last time we had an extinction event of this magnitude was 65 million years ago. Two weeks ago, the UN climate panel issued a very dire report. They said, we're at one degree now. We've increased by one degree, the temperature. And at Paris, they said, we're going to try to keep it at two degrees or less. None of that's now happening around the world. Everybody made the agreements, and they're having their little lead buildings and their little hydrogen buses and their little pilots, and we're on as business as usual. But what's happening here is our scientists are saying at the panel, we have to scale up a massive transition with a completely new economic paradigm and technological infrastructure. And guess how many years we've got before runaway feedback? Before 2040. 22 years to completely rescale the entire way we organize this Earth. They don't think we're going to make it. So what we need now, I think we might be able to make it. I'm not sure. We need a new economic vision for the world. It needs to be compelling. We need a game plan to deploy the vision. It's got to come really quick. It's got to move in all the developing countries and the industrial nations at the same speed. We have to be off the carbon deposits of this planet everywhere, everywhere, not low, everywhere before 2040. So we need to step back and ask the question, how do the great economic revolutions in history occur? If we know how they occur, we're going to get a roadmap and a compass, especially here in the insurance industry, because you're at the middle of the risk. And you've got $15 trillion in assets, none of which are being invested in the solution at this point. It's under one half of 1%, lower than other industries. There have been at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They're really interesting anthropologically because they share a common denominator. In a moment of time, three defining technologies will emerge across a civilization and converge to create what we call in engineering a, a general purpose technology platform, an infrastructure that fundamentally transforms the way society manages, powers, and moves its economic life, its social life, and its governance. What are those three technologies? <clears throat> First, new communication technologies to more efficiently manage our economic life, our social life, and our governance. That's pretty obvious. Number two, new sources of energy to more efficiently power our economic life, social life, and governance. Obvious. And number three, new modes of mobility, transportation, logistics, more efficiently move our economic life, our value chains, our supply chains, our society, and our governance. When communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes and new modes of mobility and logistics, 
It changes our temporal spatial orientation, actually the way we perceive time and space and the metaphors in which we use our language. It changes our business models fundamentally. These technology infrastructures change our governance. They change our cognition. They even change consciousness. I'm going to give you two quick examples. First Industrial Revolution, Britain, 19th century. Second Industrial Revolution, United States, 20th century. So the Brits take us into that first industrial revolution with a convergence of communication, energy, and mobility, which changed the built environment, changed our notion of the identity, and governance, everything. They took us off the German print press, very slow manual Gutenberg press, and they gave us steam power printing very quick so we could have cheap textbooks and newspapers and magazines and journals and brochures and catalogs. Then the Brits laid, off, uh, laid out a telegraph system across the British Isles in the last half of that 19th century. The, the steam power printing and the telegraph converged with a new source of energy in Britain, cheap coal, harvested by the steam engine, a British invention in the hinterlands. And then, ingenious as they were, they put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national transport, urban life, the rest is history. Second Industrial Revolution in the United States, another convergence of communication, energy, and mobility. It changed our way of life. The telephone was a really big deal. I know everyone thinks, oh my God, the internet. But try to imagine, actually for the first time in all of human history, people speaking to each other virtually, almost at the speed of light, over thousands of miles, cheap for the first time. It was a mind changer later radio and television. And those technologies for communication converged with the U.S. with a new source of energy, cheap Texas oil wells. Then Henry Ford put everybody in the internal combustion engine. Cars, buses, and trucks, road systems, urban to suburban life, shopping malls, travel, and tourism. We built the whole world around sell, making and selling those automobiles. The second industrial revolution took us into the 21st century, and it peaked. It peaked in July 2008. I'm sure you're aware of that in the insurance industry. That month, Brent crude oil hit 147 a barrel on world markets. It was, it was a record. The whole economy shut down at 147 a barrel. That was the great economic earthquake of the industrial age. The collapse of the financial market and the subprime mortgage market was a fictional market full of debt. It could not maintain itself 60 days later when the real economy shut down. Why was this the earthquake, 147 a barrel? Everything in this civilization depends on oil. Our fertilizers are made out of fossil fuels, our pesticides, our construction material, our pharmaceutical products, our synthetic fiber, our power, our transport, our heat and lights, all made out of fossil fuels. So when oil goes over 80 a barrel, watch all the other prices go up. And when oil hits around 110 a barrel, that zone means prices go up, purchasing power slows down, traffic stops moving. And now we are in a long end game where the fossil fuel industry is all fighting among themselves. So OPEC keeps the oil spigot open. They knock down oil to 30 a barrel to wipe out tar sands and shale gas. They wipe them out. Everyone goes bankrupt. Now they're back up to 70 a barrel. Shale gas is coming back and tar sands. This is an end game. Growth shutdown. And where we have oil, we have failed states. Does anybody here in the insurance industry think we're in the sunrise or cresting in the sunrise of the fossil fuel era? What are we doing here? Let me share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first couple of weeks of her government to help her address the question, how do we grow the German economy, create jobs and businesses on her watch? So when I got to Berlin, the first question I asked the new chancellor, I said, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy, create new businesses and jobs, when your businesses are plugged into a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion transportation, and that infrastructure to manage power and move your value chains and your supply chains, it peaked in its productivity in every industrial country in the world in the last 20 years. We've got the numbers. This is something you never hear about. You know, the economists say, why is productivity declining? We got all these new products. Most in e economics, economists you like to think that the, the two major indicators of productivity are better machines, put capital into better machines, and better performing workers. But the real kind of nasty little secret here is they know that's only 14% of productivity. 
Where's the other 86% come? This is where you have to bring in the chemists, the engineers, the biologists, the architects, because they use the laws of thermodynamics as the framework for defining productivity. In the business schools, they use Newtonian metaphors from the 1700s, and the only problem with that is Newton's physics doesn't have anything to do with economics. There is another factor in productivity, which all the engineers, chemists, biologists, and all know. It's based on the laws of thermodynamics that govern everything on this planet and in the universe. And that, new, that third law is called aggregate efficiency. Aggregate efficiency is the ratio of potential work to the actual useful work that gets embedded into a good or service at every stage of its journey from nature to us back to nature and what's lost in every single conversion along the journey, all right? When you have to extract it and ship it and store it and make things out of it and then you have to consume it and recycle it. This is aggregate efficiency. It's based on thermodynamics. It works the same way in nature. If a lion chases down an antelope and kills that antelope in the wild, you know how much of the actual the actual energy of that antelope gets embedded into the lion? About 10 to 20 percent. That's its aggregate efficiency. The rest is lost in the conversion, the chase, the heat. That's thermodynamics. So what does this have to do with my conversation with the Chancellor of Germany? She's a physicist by background. And I said to her, the United States started the second industrial revolution around 1903 at about 3 percent aggregate efficiency. <laughs> every conversion of every material, product, service, we lost about 98 percent. By the late 90s, we got up to 14% aggregate efficiency across this infrastructure, communication, energy, mobility infrastructure. We peaked. Germany got up to 18.5%. They peaked. Japan led the world at 20%. They peaked. So what I said to this chancellor, we now know that aggregate efficiency makes up most of the rest of productivity. So if it's peaked at between 14 and 20% in every industrial country, that is the actual peak you can get out of this infrastructure of centralized telecommunication fossil fuel oils, nuclear power. So I said, you can have market reform. They did. You can have labor reform. They did. You can have fiscal reform. They did. You can actually, you can actually um, induce a thousand Steve Jobs. It won't make any difference as long as your businesses are plugged into this 20th century infrastructure whose aggregate efficiency and productivity has peaked over the last two decades. This is a problem facing every country, not just Germany. So on that first day with the chancellor, we talked about a third industrial revolution, a new convergence of communication, energy, and mobility to manage power and move Germany. We'd already, that conversation was already starting to move toward uh, codes, regulation, standards, and build out in Brussels and across Europe. But Germany was crucial to making it happen. At the end of the day, the chancellor said, Mr. Rifkin, we'll have this third industrial revolution for Germany. And I'll report back on Germany and all of Europe in a, in a bit. We are in the midst of a great revolution in communication, energy, and mobility, and a new infrastructure that's going to change the business model for the insurance industry, and I'm going to leave you for last. It's been 28 years since the World Wide Web. Everybody here has a smartphone on them right now. Three and a half billion people are connected at very low fixed cost, near zero marginal cost. You just need a service provider. The whole world will be connected within 15 years because China now has a smartphone $25 with more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon. There are villages in the Amazon now holding those smartphones, and they have more power in their hands, literally, than sent our astronauts to the moon in terms of computing and digital information. So now this communication internet, which is digital in here, is beginning to converge in Europe and the People's Republic of China with a new emerging renewable energy internet in which our power and electricity grid is being transformed into a renewable energy internet, all digital, so that millions of people already in Europe and China can begin to produce their own solar and wind electricity on site and then send it back across this digitalized renewable energy internet, the new utility grid, and share that energy there just like they share information, news, and knowledge on the communication internet. It's identical. Now these two digital internets, the communication internet, already here. The energy internet, it's moving quickly in Europe and China. They are now converging with a third internet, an automated GPS guided mobility and logistics internet made of shared services, cars, trucks, drones, everyone within 10 years. They'll be driverless, they'll be electric, they already are moving in, they'll be fuel cell, they'll be made out of 3D printed composite materials, Ford, Daimler, they're all working on it and we're already introducing it into the market. 
These three internets, the communication internet digital, the renewable energy internet digital, the mobility internet digital, to manage power and move the economy, society and governance, they ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. We are placing sensors across the entire environment, both the built environment and the wild environment. So we've got sensors in the agricultural fields and the factories and the smart homes and the smart vehicles and the smart warehouses and the smart roads and they're collecting data in real time. Where's that data going? Not to the cloud, which is just an abstract, you know, PR term. It's increasingly going to a communication internet and now an energy internet and a mobility internet so we can all better manage power and move our value chains. By 2030, we will have created a ubiquitous planetary interconnectivity, possibly. This is a, the brain is Galileo and C GPS and they synchronize the nervous system, which are all the sensors. We're creating a prothesis of the collectivity of the human nervous system. On the upside, huge potential leap forward for humanity because we can now engage in much more even playing field for social entrepreneurialism on a massive scale. It shifts globalization dramatically because the first and second industrial revolutions, uh, and I'm jumping ahead, but the first and second industrial revolutions required vertical integration for economies of scale, so you ended up with about 500 companies. I think and now in Fortune 500 that are 28% of the GDP with only 62 million workers. Third Industrial Revolution is quite different, as I'm about to lay this out. It favors a laterally scaled world, and increasingly we're starting to see cities and regions with this technology, they're able to virtually and physically engage each other anywhere at any time all over the world in real business, and they can move from globalization to global, glocalization. That's happening now in real time. That's changing everything. That's not going to go away. That's a shift in power, literally and figuratively, to the regions, the localities, not just the cities, the provinces. We'll come back with some examples later. While this is exciting, and we all, especially millennials, they are enjoying Skyping in global classrooms. They're all on Facebook. They're gaming and sporting together. They're beginning to bring themselves together as a human family. But on the other hand, it's also terrifying. Because the moment we get excited about our interconnectivity, we're all using it, we start thinking, wait a minute. What about the dark net? That's as impressive as the bright net. How do we ensure network neutrality when everyone's connected, that everyone has equal access? How do we ensure governments don't purloin this Internet of Things, Third Industrial Revolution, for political purpose like hacking the U.S. presidential elections in 2016? That was a big deal. How do we ensure against um, monopolies by Internet companies where they are taking our lifetime value and every experience we have from Google Maps to Facebook is being sold to a third party without our knowledge and we're becoming a commodity, the ultimate commodity, our lifetime value. How do we make sure data security is protected? How do we protect privacy? And how do we ensure against, ensure, I keep saying ensure, <laughs> right place. How do we ensure against climate events that can take down the system at any given time and they're doing it massively everywhere now wait till 20 years from now if we don't change quick, and how do we make sure that we can um, stay, stay uh, online, if you will, with terrorist attacks. This is the dark net. We're going to have to spend as much time on building redundancy, circularity into this dark net, or we're not going to make the bright net happen. And that means that, and this is crucial for the insurance industry, when you start looking at where you want to go, with all the assets at $15 trillion, you need to invest in infrastructure that builds redundancy and circularity and resilience in, and that's where you insure, because then if there's any climate event, for example, in one place, you can move your entire system and disaggregate and decentralize and go off grid. The system I'm describing, if Puerto Rico had it, they would have been back up and running within three days, three days. You have to have a distributed, redundant, circular, resilient systems. And that's why if the insurance industry has one big task in mind, I'm jumping ahead again, is to take that $15 trillion and begin to invest in the assets on this infrastructure I'm laying out and then insure based on those assets being in so that you can understand uh, the risk in a very unpredictable Anthropocene that we're moving into. There's no guarantees even with that. So 
let's go to what the advantages are of the Internet of Things. Let's say you're a small and medium-sized enterprise in Ireland or even a large company. You can already go on this emerging Internet of Things and get a transparent picture, if it stays open, network neutral, of all the data starting to flow. Then you can strip out the data you care about in your value chain for your company. Strip it out from all the data flowing across the system. Then mine that data with your own analytics. Create your own algorithms and apps. So you can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every conversion across your supply chains and value chains. And by doing that, increase your productivity. Reduce your fixed cost and plunge your marginal cost and your ecological footprint. Because you're getting more out of each conversion and losing less of the earth that you're using. This is the actual model. And what's happening is it's already coming online. And what it means is that um, we are beginning to see a transformation in the business model because when your marginal costs start to go low, your profits decline. And that means when your profits decline, you have to find another model for how your industry works. Let's take the insurance industry. All of our industries now are market, they're, they're capitalist markets. They're transactional. You make a sale, you stop. Then you come together and make another sale, you stop. It is a start-stop transactional me mechanism. Too slow. When your margins are low, you have to move from ownership to access, from sellers and buyers to provider user networks. You have to move from consumerism to sustainability, circularity, and resilience against risk. This is a fundamental shift. That requires every industry moving from markets to networks. And each industry is no longer an industry, but a competency and a node. And each of those nodes brings a competency together, and they blockchain with other competencies so that you can help build and manage those networks. The networks will be owned by the regions. They will be public utilities, but companies can manage those networks and blockchain them uh, and securitize them. Some of the marginal costs are now getting so low that they're heading to near zero, and they've given birth to a completely new economic system called the sharing economy, late birth capitalism. This sharing economy is a young baby. Uh, it was birthed by capitalism. But let me be clear, it's the first new economic system to enter onto the world stage since capitalism and socialism in the 19th century. It's, it's a pretty remarkable event. Part of it's being absorbed into the capitalist system like Uber. A part of it is not being absorbed in the capitalist system, like Wikipedia. Right? Part of it is parallel, part of it is competitive. But we are going to be in two economic systems from here on out. Part capitalist networks that are provider user and basis on services flowing 24-7, and part a sharing economy where uh, what we produce for each other is not in the GDP. So people say, wait, this sounds like way off in the future. I'm always amused. No, this has been happening now since the World Wide Web. We now have 3.5 billion people this afternoon who are prosumers. They're still sellers and buyers, but they're moving to provider user networks with low marginal costs. We've got millions of young people right now this afternoon. Right now, they're sharing their music. What is it? You know that Korean performance artist a few years ago? What did it cost him to buy a simple digital recorder with studio quality now? Cheap. And then he put out that little song and dance, remember that? Two billion people came to his website in 60 days. All he needed was a service provider. How's that for leveling the field for marketing? We have young people producing and sharing their own news media, their own social blogs. They are producing every day millions of videos they're sharing with each other uh, and entertaining each other. None of that's in the GDP, by the way. Uh, they are contributing to Wikipedia. They're taking massive open online college courses taught by the best professors. This is a high dropout rate, but they're getting college credits. Wikipedia is the one that really, I, I don't know how Jimmy Wales came up with this. I didn't think it would work. We now have democratized knowledge literally for free all over the world in less than 15 years. It's the sixth largest website. It only costs 50 million in donations a year. And if you take the pornographic websites out, it's probably number one. And so we've democratized education, news, and knowledge. And apparently, people have nothing else to do. Because I'll put something up on the, on the World Wide Web, and within an hour on Wikipedia, they're all crawling over it. People are editing it, saying, this is wrong. Where's the footnote? I'm going to amplify it. Can imagine we are constructing a knowledge of the world for nearly free. 
That is impressive. Now, whole industries have been disrupted, the music industry, newspapers, book publishing, et cetera, but whole new industries have emerged, and not just Facebook, Google, Twitter, Amazon. We've got thousands of startups and companies, profit and nonprofit, and they're creating the platforms and the apps, they're doing the data and the analytics. We thought there'd be a firewall. I want you to think of this, because I'm going to get to you last about what, we, what has to happen in the insurance industry on this model. So we thought there'd be a firewall, and while we could understand how near zero marginal cost brought on by the digitalization of communication, energy, mobility, and the built environment would affect the, the virtual world, entertainment, news, and knowledge, we just didn't see how it would affect the physical world. The Internet of Things breaks the firewall. Things, Internet of Things, everything is now digital. Let's go back and talk about energy. We now have millions of people producing their own energy in Europe and China and parts of the west coast of the U.S at near zero marginal cost. And we got millions of young people in car sharing services and within a few years they're going to be, those services are going to be with electric fuel cell vehicles and recycled 3D material, the costs are going to be really low. It's going to be based on the service, not on the transaction in the market. So let's go back to Germany, where are we 12 years later? 35 to 40 percent of our electricity in Germany is now uh, solar and wind at near zero marginal cost will be 100% off fossil fuels and nuclear all gone by way before 2040. What's interesting is the fixed cost for solar and wind. They're plummeting. They're on an exponential curve just like the computer chips at Intel. This is what people don't understand yet, even the politicians. You know, although all they have to do is open up the business pages of Bloomberg or FT and they can see all the data anywhere. So when I was a kid, no computers. I was born in World War II. Okay, 45. First computer was at my university. I teach the Wharton School, executive ed. We created the first computer. It's called the UNIVAC, all right? But at the time, IBM's chairman said, we will probably estimate that we need five computers for the world. Yeah, all the millennials, they drop over on that one. Uh, but then Intel began to, the engineers began to double the capacity and half those computer chips cost every two years. Now China's smartphone, $25. We are on the same curve now with solar and wind. To, to generate the fixed cost of one watt solar in 1978, $79. You got it? Today, the fixed cost of generating that solar watt is 40 cents. It's going to 35 next year. It's plummeting. And we now have power and utility companies buying long-term contracts for solar and wind, 20-year contracts in the last 18 months for 5 cents, 4 cents, 3 cents, 2 cents a kilowatt hour. We don't need any tariffs anymore. We don't need any subsidies. It's over. And here's what you need to know in the insurance industry, especially when you take a look at how you're going to invest those $15 trillion that you have invested now in the old infrastructure. That's where it all is, less than a half a percent in the new. In the power and utility companies, I meet with the CEOs all year round. There is panic, just like what happened when we saw the music industry and book publishing and television. There's literally panic. The disruption is now hit. And so what's going on now is this. A couple of years ago, Citibank issued a study, and they said we now have $100 trillion, $100 trillion in stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry. Your eyebrow was correct. That's the biggest bubble in all of human history. At Citibank, look it up, $100 trillion. Because the costs of solar and wind are plummeting so fast, it's over. And Mark Carney, Bank of England president, met with Lloyds. You saw that speech a while back. And he said, the stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry, this is the elephant in the room for the entire civilization. We're heading to the end of the fossil fuel era. The disruption is massive, $100 trillion in stranded assets. Who's going to pay for that bailout? So what's interesting is once you pay the fixed cost, the marginal cost of this electricity is nearly zero. You know the sun has not sent us a bill yet in Europe. We've not had a single invoice from the wind. What happens when in Europe and China, we've developed, I worked with the leadership there, we've, our program there is called Internet, China Internet Plus, the program here is Smart Europe. What happens when in other regions of the world, how do they compete with regions that have a third industrial revolution energy internet where the actual power you use across your entire value chain and supply chains is near zero marginal cost? 
it's not just Europe, it's China. Uh, China's interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. We've been working on this plan and moving it across Europe now for about 19 years, but uh, to my surprise, I'd never worked in China, but when, Premier, when President Xi and Premier Li came into office, Premier Li put out his biography, which was a new thing for them, and he had uh, mentioned in his biography, and I thought this was j actually a joke when I saw it on the internet, he read the Third Industrial Revolution, that book that I did, and he instructed, he said in his biography, the central government to move on the narrative I'm talking to you about in the insurance industry this afternoon. So I've been working with the leadership, the National Development Reform Commission, and the State Council, and the National Academy of Sciences, and MIIT. Boy, do they move fast. You've got to know how fast they're moving. About 11 weeks after my first formal visit with the leadership, they announced $82 billion to completely digitalize the state grid, which is the largest electricity grid in, Ch in China and the world, and they're doing it now in the current five-year plan. And what's happening is uh, they are no longer subsidizing the solar and wind as of this week, but they're getting people all over China to buy their own solar and wind from their own companies so they can generate their electricity locally and s what they don't need, they send it back. They got the biggest market in the world. It's the domestic market. Smart. What does this have to do with uh, the power relations? There are four major power companies in Germany, EMBW, RWE, Vattenfall, EMBW that I worked with for a while, uh, Mr. Klaus when he was there. We thought they were invincible 12 years ago. I want you to think about this for the major insurance companies. But what happened to them in the last 12 years is what happened to music, newspapers, book publishing, and other industries. The disruption came very quick. The transition is 30 years. All over Europe, Germany is a good test case, even little Denmark, people are creating electricity cooperatives. Farmers, small businesses, neighborhood associations, they all got loans from the banks. The banks knew they'd pay back on the energy they generated. Nobody defaulted. 96% of all the electricity of the 21st century third industrial revolution is produced by small players in neighborhoods. The big companies can't scale it. You have to collect the sun everywhere. If you're collecting coal, oil, and gas, you need a lot of money and investment and vertical integration to return that investment, right? and you've got to protect and secure your oil, your gas, et cetera. The sun does shine everywhere, and the wind shines everywhere, so you have to collect it everywhere. That's the built environment. Does this mean the end of the power companies? No. Now I'm going to go into the model of what they have to do to change their model, and then we're going to talk about a few other models, then we're going to get to insurance. So about five years ago, Eon asked if I would debate Mr. Tyson, their president. He's still there. We had a two-hour debate, and I said, look, you're not leaving the second Industrial Revolution infrastructure tomorrow morning, but the disruptions now, you have to move quickly within the next three to four years. You will be out of the game. But the actual transition is 25 years. But you can't wait five to have a plan. So you need to amortize out your old business based on markets, seller and buyer markets, right, and ownership, and you have to amortize it out by creating also a separate company that's a model for a third industrial revolution business proposition based on services rather than transactions. All right? In the new model, I said to him, you make money by not generating any electricity because we're all generating it where we live and work in our neighborhoods. That's all over the world. Within 20 years from now, everyone's going to generate their own electricity if we make it in time because they're putting, they're putting photovoltaics now in paint. They're going to paint their house. They're putting in glass. They'll put in the glass in your house. It's everywhere. They're putting it in road systems. It's going to be everywhere. The sun has got enough energy until kingdom comes here. So I said, you're not going to generate any electricity, and the way you're going to make money is by selling less electricity. All right. So he said, we're not going to generate any, and we're going to sell less, and you're going to tell me how we're going to make money. What you're going to do, I said, is you're going to set up partnerships with thousands and thousands of businesses, small, medium, and large, and you're going to help manage the energy flowing through their value chain across the energy internet. You're going to help them with that big data by helping them mine the analytics so they can create their own algorithms and apps, continually updating them so that every conversion, every 24 hours, you're helping them always increase their aggregate efficiency and productivity, reduce their ecological footprint and marginal cost. In return, those thousands of businesses will share their productivity back with you in performance contracts. This isn't, this isn't too difficult to know. You know, IBM faced this in the mid-90s. They saw the internet by then. They knew it. And they realized that the computer was their big cash cow. 
the big blue. But by that time, the Japanese, the Koreans, everybody had the same computer. It was just a box, and they were selling it cheaper. So Gerstner and his team said, well, wait a minute. If we're not making any money on selling a box, what is the expertise we really have? Managing information. Now everyone has a CIO, correct? So we're going to get to you. What is the actual expertise in this room? It's managing risk. It's understanding risk. Keep that in mind. So what I said to him is, you're going to have to move to this new model. He, didn't, he said no. He waited five years. He put his nuclear and fossil fuel on the market last year. There's no bids. It's stranded. But he's moving into these services. And so is RWE. And so is EMBW. They all are. And EDF is with us in northern France. Our global group is, is in the fifth year of actually deploying all of northern France, which Halte de France, the industrial rust belt. They've been on the ground with us for four years. They know there's, they're still in nuclear, but they understand they've got to move to the new model or they're going to be lost. So they're coming together the communication internet with the digitalized energy internet gives rise to the digitalized, autonomous, driverless, electric and fuel cell internet for road, rail, water, air, and drone transport. We built the entire global economy on making and selling cars. Shopping centers and travel and tourism is all about cars. Here's the problem. Can everybody under the age of 39 raise their hands, every millennial in this room? They are the problem. You are the problem. <laughs> you have really screwed up our entire worldview because apparently you don't want to own cars. That's grandma and grandpa, two cars, sitting in the driveway, waxing them once a month. You want access to mobility and car sharing networks, not ownership of vehicles in old-fashioned markets. Do I have this right? And beginning with your generation and your children and grandchildren, you're just not going to own cars again. That's done. You're going to be in autonomous electric fuel cell vehicles. Now, for every car you're sharing, we're eliminating 15 cars. The auto companies know this. I work with Daimler, Ford, some of and those two companies. So does this mean this is the end of the transport industry? Not necessarily but the key players have to have a new business model quickly and be able to blockchain across competencies and work with other industries to help manage the data on these webs. Ownership to access, markets to networks, sellers and buyers to providers and users, consumerism to sustainability, externalities eliminated with circularity, productivity moves to generativity. So let me give you an example of Daimler. A couple of, I've been working with Daimler for quite a while. They gave us the, the second industrial revolution. They gave us the internal combustion engine. So a couple of years ago, Wolfgang Bernhardt, who was chairman at Daimler Trucks and on the board of directors, said, Jeremy, come to Germany. We're going to announce the mobility internet. I came and we did three rollouts, one for the journalists and then another one where we brought all the engineers of Daimler from around the world and I worked with them on the business model. And the third, we brought all their clients in over a period of a year. This is what's really cool. On the first day with the journalists, uh, we laid out the narrative, and then Wolfgang Bernhardt got up and he said, and no one knew this, they had quietly outfitted 200,000 Daimler trucks with sensors all over the outside of the trucks, turning them into mobile big data centers, and they were on the roads already. No one knew. And they're capturing data on weather conditions, traffic, warehouse availability, moment to moment when they come in and out, everything. And what they're going to do with that is they're going to use that data so that thousands of businesses across Europe and around the world, they can work with those businesses to help them so they're not deadheading. They can cooperatize warehouses. They start moving so there's uh, any other carrier can modularly take your stuff to the final destination. That's what the IoT allows. Transport's probably the most inefficient industry. We're deadheading. We're taking half cargo. This can all change. And what was really cool, the last part of that afternoon, they had a helicopter feed live, and they went down to the German Expressway in real time, and we were all talking to the drivers in three trucks. And then Wolfgang said, take your hand off the wheel and take your foot off the pedal. They had retrained the drivers as uh, analysts, and they had the computer screen up, and the trucks started to come together as a train, automated, running by themselves, while they're securing data in mobile data centers like trains. So cool. This is the new model. Are they giving up selling trucks tomorrow morning? No. Or cars? No. 
But this is the shift. You have to be able to see your legacy industries. This isn't rocket science. You can see what's happening. And then what are your emerging business models? So that's essentially the system, but the system rides on top of the built environment. The Internet of Things are the buildings. They're the homes, the offices, the factories, the shopping malls. Each building across Europe and around the world is going to be retrofitted, which is millions of workers. AI and robots aren't going to do this. Heavy retrofitted to make it efficient. Then we transform every building, including the buildings you work in, into nodes. Those nodes become distributed data centers because what's going to happen in this next part of the struggle, the centralized data that you see in Google, Facebook, Twitter, and Amazon, you're all worried about, it's going to be gone with blockchains. We're going to have distributed data with public utilities and regions controlling it. We're already seeing this in our test regions. And every building becomes its own distributed data center that blockchains particular data with other, others in that blockchain commons. Every building then becomes a, uh, a generator of solar, wind, geothermal, electricity, right? And every building becomes a charging station for your electric and fuel cell vehicles, and the energy you use is stored so you can send it or keep it whenever you like. Those nodes then connect across regions, and then regions build this system out, the architecture of the system, customizing to the region, and then like Wi-Fi, they connect across regions. So we have three regions now. You can see and come and see them. Haute de France was a rust belt, everybody leaving, big unemployment. Five years later, we just had the anniversary. They were selected as the lead entrepreneurial region of the 350 regions of Europe in year three. They have 1,200 projects moving. They're scaling to two to three billion right now in euros in infrastructure. They've taken the coal mining region and the grandchildren are now been trained to retrofit and they're putting solar and wind across 23,000 homes. And we are in the petrochemical complex of the Netherlands. Our global team has been working with uh, the 23 cities from Rotterdam to The Hague. And they are working together so the life sciences can come together with the chemical sciences and begin to find new business models beyond using chemists and biologists together to move to biology and out of fossil fuels, among other things. Luxembourg we're in, the financial capital, and they are beginning to create codes, regulations, and standards for the nation states. This is what we call smart Europe. We introduced it uh, last year. Uh, I joined Meryl Sefcovic, the Vice President of the European Commission in charge of the Energy Union, Smart Europe, and we joined the Committee of the Regions, and we announced a 70, I'm sorry, a 741 billion euro Juncker fund to get this done. Where's the insurance industry? One half of 1% of your 15 trillion is in this, and in the United States, Europe's doing a little better. You have some key companies, but you probably know that your US counterparts only three of the major 80 companies have any decarbonization plan internally or have investments. Less than 1%, only three companies. This industry is far behind. So let's get to the insurance industry. Nobody knows what's happening better than you do. I am sure that all your analysts are talking about the water cycles and how it's impacting you. We know that we can't get flood insurance for most of the people that are being flooded, or drought, or all of that. We also know that uh, the, right now, the insurance company is what I call a paralysis moment. They know this disruption's here. They're not sure how to proceed. We need first players, and Europe will be the first players. That's why I accepted this invitation to be here, because you are, as, as far behind as you are, you're ahead of the game with everybody else. All right? So that's a good thing. You actually care. All right, so here's the new model. If you're going to move from selling a commodity insurance to, provide, uh, insurance to providing a service, what would that service look like? Well, for beginners, you would invest in infrastructure in regions that make them resilient, build out this infrastructure so that public utilities can guarantee a circular infrastructure that's high efficiency, a carbon footprint down to zero, right? You help build out that infrastructure, all right? And then you help manage the risk. But the key is you want to reduce that risk so that you have a service you can provide. And if that, if that region or if that local business or if that homeowner is engaged in those transformational policies, well, let's say they have solar on their roof, okay? And then there's a climate event like uh, hit New York. There were all sorts of homes that had solar on the roof. They couldn't use them because the power company wouldn't give them a little let them have a little $25 converter to go off grid. They could have had their own solar up the next day. 
So the insurance industry has to begin to develop services based on, one, your investment in this infrastructure, because you have massive investment not going here, $15 trillion. And then where this infrastructure is put in, whether it's a, a local business or an entire region, then they would benefit on the risk analysis because they built in resilience and redundancy in the system, whether it be shoring up uh, on the coast, uh, their wetlands, uh, or then the insurance risk should be better for them, or whether they're putting in the energy internet, so if there's a climate event and the system goes down, uh, they can go up really quickly and re-aggregate. There's all sorts of things along this line of communication, energy, mobility, and the IoT that allows you to both invest in the infrastructure for this increased circularity and resilience and redundancy, and at the same time, provide risk services. And those services should not be transactional. You should be on the ground all the time with education, with helping those regions and how they avoid risk by understanding all the new technologies. Because the mission here would be for the insurance industry not just to sell against risk, because the risk is going to be very unpredictable in the Anthropocene, let me tell you. But you also have to work with communities and with regions to help them on the services. Let me give you an example of the power and utility companies that are doing this, in the, a couple of them in the US. A couple of um, Anne Marie Primajores, the, the head of, um, of Con Ed Chicago, Chicago, and also she's the CEO of all of Exelon, the biggest power company in the country. She uses the model that we introduced a number of years ago. And what she's doing is her utility is not just a utility that provides electricity. They're providing all sorts of services. They're aggregating folks. They're helping them change over their homes. They're helping them with their efficiencies and all of these things. And they're working together. They're working together so then they could help them uh, uh, watch the flow of energy across their buildings, help them with their energies, and then in return, uh, they get some of that performance contracting back. You can do that with risk and insurance. You can do that tomorrow morning. It needs to be done. Last thought. I don't think it's just about technology. And I know somebody's going to come up with me with a 10-year-old in your home. You're going to say, are we too late? I don't know. I'm not a utopian, but I know we have a business plan that works here. We have Fortune 500 companies involved. We have regions involved. We have all of Europe and China on board. I don't know if we can get there in time. But here's what I'll say, which should give you some maybe guarded hope. We built out the entire first industrial revolution in the 19th century in less than 40 years, two generations, the juvenile infrastructure. And if you look at America and Europe, we built out the entire juvenile infrastructure, telecommunications, electricity, the road systems, uh, the pipelines. We did it in less than 40 years, too. Why couldn't we do this in less than 40? The problem is we're racing against the clock. And the second problem is we're racing against old codes, regulations, and standards at the national and EU levels and around the world that are keeping us locked in from the new services you could provide. So what I'm going to ask you to do here is we have a mission. The insurance industry of Europe will need to lead like other industries have led, like ICT and like power and utility and like transport and mobility and like real estate and construction. You're, in a sense, the elephant in the room because you're about risk and you've got trillions of dollars tied up in the old system that is now moving to a stranded asset. That's really going to kill you. Move tomorrow morning. But let me end with this. I think it's more than technology. Uh, when, when we meet with governments, uh, we say to heads of state, if you have another plan, tell us what it is. To address climate change, move jobs. There's a huge jobs and businesses here. It's going to require millions of people to retrofit the buildings. We know this in Europe. We've done it. Robots and AI will not put insulation in your attic. Robots and AI will not dig down under the ground and put in the 5G cable. Robots and AI will not assemble these huge windmills, wind turbines. AI and robots will not sit there and help regulate those advanced meters and the charging stations, all right? Eventually, we're going to create a smart capitalist network system, and it'll be smaller workforces. But in the next two generations, it's going to be a lot of semi-skilled, skilled, skilled and professional labor to build this out, which gives us a silver lining for, two, for at least a generation. But here's, I think, what really has to change, consciousness. We all grew up in this room with geopolitical consciousness. After the peace of Westphalia, we said every nation is sovereign and owns its territory. 
and every citizen, every nation is sovereign and competes with every other citizen for scarce resources and a zero sum came in the market. And every nation uh, competes with other nations for scarce resources in the market and sometimes in the battlefield. I don't have to remind you in Europe, you fought two world wars over coal and oil, coal in the Ruhr Valley and oil in Asia and Eurasia. So what we have now is can anybody tell me how we are going to address climate change, bring the human family together, create these new business models, move the regions with that worldview? We got kids coming home in the developing world and the developed world, and they're asking that they have biosphere consciousness, not geopolitical consciousness. They are understanding from school that the biosphere is at 19 kilometers from the stratosphere to the ocean and to the lithosphere, where the chemistry of the planet, the spheres of the planet interact with the biology of life in a complex choreography. So they're saying to their dad, why are you using so much water when you're shaving? We actually have wildfires five miles away from drought. Turn it off. Why is the TV on in that room for background noise? We haven't used that room for three weeks. Turn it off. Why two cars? Why not get rid of one? Let's car share. And the one I'm particularly fond of, where'd the hamburger come from on the plate? The kids are saying, did that, did that hamburger come from a rainforest? Because a lot of it's coming from the Amazon and other places now. Do they have to burn down all those trees for six inches of topsoil to graze that cow from my hamburger? And when those trees are destroyed in those uh, very complex ecosystems, all sorts of wildlife dies because they're only germane to that ecosystem. They're extinct. And if the trees aren't there anymore because we burned them down to graze the cow for the hamburger, they're not absorbing CO2 from industrial global warming emissions. That means the temperature of the planet goes up and some farmer can't feed her kids in some subsistence farm in rural India because she's getting flooding all over the spring and she's getting summer droughts and wildfires. That's the burger. The kids are actually learning ecological footprint. They're learning that everything we do intimately affects everyone else and all of the life on this planet. So here's my hope. This insurance industry has to come forward and lead. And it will be Europe in the insurance industry that will lead the other continents, I have no doubt about it. And you've already started, and there are some first good players uh, in best in show, but tomorrow morning it shouldn't be business as usual. If we really do think this is happening, and we are parents and grandparents, or we're millennials with a family, what's our choice here? To just watch ourselves boil away in the pot like the frog? So please, tomorrow morning, when you go back to your insurance company, have the meetings, have the conversations. I'll give you my cards. We'll put you in touch with people uh, all over Europe. We'll put you in touch with the three regions and with Brussels so you can start working with them and other industries as well. Because without you, we're not going to get this done. With you, I think we can have some guarded hope. We may make a transition and hopefully replenish this planet. Hopefully. Thank you.